Sunshine Coast, Queensland. Traditional land of the Gubby Gubby people. The Yowie has always been significant within the Aboriginal culture. Although both the Aboriginals and Yowie shared common grounds in terms of habitation, as with most Indigenous tribes around the world, there's always a deep fear of the hairy man, particularly at night. Often being described as living between two dimensions, the smaller Tinjadi was notably feared. That said, just like the differences in the name of the Yowie, we've also learned there are variations in opinion of what they are within the culture. Among the various names by differing tribes and dialects, two of the most reported and recorded names in journals from the early 1800s were Dibble Dibble and Yahoo. The name Yowie wasn't formally coined for many years later. Because the Aboriginals had no written language, only a spoken language, there were many different ways to interpret and spell words depending on how it was sounding when spoken. The dialect quandary of the term Yowie began from similar sounding words such as Yuri, Yori, Yari, etc. It was penned as Yowie in 1962 by a man by the name of PJ Gresser while writing about the Aboriginals in Southeast Australia. You'll be hard pressed to find many other prior written references. During these times, we were told both the Janjadi and the large Yowie could arrive upon you with almost no noise and were sometimes attributed with the abduction of women and children. Children were rarely allowed to venture away from camp at night and some parents counted each child while in bed to check there wasn't one missing or one too many. If people left camp at night, they often took fire for protection and none of them liked being at the end of the line while walking. In some circles many years ago, the Yowie was once considered a subject only spoken to white people with permission of elders. However, as historic documentation shows, this is not entirely true in all cases. In fact, many of the First Nations people enjoyed talking about the Yowie in those times, as many of the writings from the 1800s reflect. And moreover, in today's times, we find most Indigenous people share their stories with great enthusiasm. Now more than ever before, people with an Indigenous heritage are coming forward to tell the AYR of their own experiences and those of elder relatives both living and past, and have their Yowie stories formally recorded and documented, rather than lost forever. In this week's Witness Audio Report, we visit Yandina, which means go on foot in the traditional language of the Gubby Gubby people. It's time for AYR's Sarah Bignall to take it from here, as I say, welcome to the Wapper Dam. I had a chance to listen to the chat that you had with Paul Cropper. It was absolutely fascinating. Dean Harrison and I would like to share your story of your sighting at the Wapa Dam, but uh, because there was a lot of noise in the background when you were talking to Paul, I wondered if you could tell me that story again. I've had a lot of run-ins with, with the Quinkin, quite a few actually. Only one bad one, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of them on the Sunshine Coast. I had another family with me camping up there that night, a Maori family. He's a bushman too. He loves the bush. He grew up in the bush in New Zealand in the mountains, pig hunting and that. It's burned into his brain. That's the first thing he mentions every time I speak to him and it's the last thing he mentions. Would you be able to tell me that particular sighting that you had with your family there and your friends and then I might ask you some questions after that? We were up waiting on a house to come through and we just thought, oh, well, bugger it, we'll go out and do a bit of camping. We were out there for about three weeks in total. It was fine the first week, but I knew something was wrong that afternoon because Izzy turned up on dark, him, Mel and the kids. He opened the door of the car and just collapsed on the ground. 
Mm-hmm. It's collapsed, like fainted. And Izzy's a Christian man. He goes to church every Sunday. He goes to a Tongan church. But, yeah, he's a very Christian man. And I talked to him about it a few months ago, and he can't even remember that. And that's what I thought was weird because I'd known the guy for years, about 10 years at the time, and he just got out of the car. He looked at me and said, how are you going? And then he just collapsed on the ground. It took about three minutes to get him up, but it was after he left because they left about it would have been 7.30, it was about 8.39, and my brother was collecting firewood in a fire break on the backside of Whopper Dam as you go up to the dam entrance and then you know, pretty off the road. I had the two four-wheel drives parked, and I had a bot light in the back of the four-wheel drive that was shining in the tray, and me and Jaden were sleeping in there. All the kids and Melissa were in the tent, Kenny and Pick were in there, and my brother was in his four-wheel drive in the tray beside me. And he was collecting firewood probably 30 metres away, and I had the radio on loud enough that, you know, I shouldn't have heard what I heard, but it sounded like what a branch would sound like, but about the size of a man's leg. It broke, something stood on it, and I knew it straight away. And my brother dropped the firewood, and he spun around with the most scared look on his face, and he pointed straight to where it come from, and he said, there's something there. There is something there. And I said, yeah, I know. I heard it. And I called Kenny over and said, can you turn the radio down? And I had a 50-inch light bar that I'd taken off my brother's four-wheel drive and rigged up to a longer wire and a switch in it so I could use that for a big camp light. And it was big as a 20,000 lumen light bar, so it lit up the bush like daytime. And when the log cracked, I said to Kenny, kill the radio, bring me the light bar. So he picked it up off the roof, killed the radio and handed it to me. As soon as I flicked it on, I watched him walk behind a tree no more than 12 feet away from me. He was eight feet from the edge of the bush because the firelight shined out as wide as the firebreak was, but from the tree line on, you couldn't see nothing. It was pitch black, pitch black. He tried to hide behind the tree, but he was too wide. Oh, he was thick, eight, probably eight and a half foot tall and wide, wide. I've carried a lot of pigs out of the bush in my life. He would have been at least, at least 600, 700 pounds, 350, 350, 400 kilos. Easy, easy, easy. My brother dropped the logs. Well, he dropped the handful of logs, pointed to it, and then run straight to me. And he's, he's a big boy, my brother. He'd spent a fair bit of time in the bush too, as a young fella, and with me as well. And it's scarred him to this moment. He won't go out at night time anymore. He won't leave the house at dark. No matter where he lives, even if it's in a city. What happened then? When he walked behind the tree, he turned around and put his back up against the tree, squatted down and then turned around right behind the tree and he just grabbed the tree and peeked out at us. And when he was squatting down, he was as tall as me. About five foot ten and a half and he was taller than me when he was squatting and he was squatting that low that his ass was nearly touching the ground. And he just peeked out, was staring at me and Jaden for a good, oh, good two or three minutes. And my brother was screaming like, you know, when somebody's in fear of their life and they're just in absolute terror. He was screaming and screaming and he snapped and looked at my brother and his whole face expression changed. And then I looked at my brother and screamed at him to shut up. I just said, just shut up, shut up, don't make any noise. And he looked straight back at me when I talked. And then he was just staring at my son for a long time. Well, what was his son doing? Tears were flying out of his eyes. He was crying. He was making the bodily gestures of crying, but there was no noise coming out of him. He, he wasn't, I don't I think he was too scared to make a noise. Thing, he would have been terrified. He was. He was. He still wakes up. I hear him in his dreams sometimes screaming, stop looking at me, stop looking at me. So, and he drew him perfect. He drew a picture for Paul. I've still got it here. There's more than one type of them. They're not all the same. No, the little one... He's different. He's different again. He's that's something you don't want to muck with. That's Janjari or Junjari or some black fellas call him Brown Jack, Hairy Man, but he's different again. He's he's not a he's not a living, breathing creature. They're ancient entities, ancient spirits, shapeshifters. Incredibly tricky. Incredibly tricky. My dad's seen the little ones. I've never seen I've known they've been around. Because my old man's a very spiritual man. He's a stolen generation, an Aboriginal and a Bushman. He spent a lot of time in the scrub. And they run on all fours. Mostly they move on all fours. I've seen them run. Are you talking about the, the Junja D? The big guy. The big guy runs on all fours. Yes. We've had, we've had lots of reports of that, actually. <laughs> they aren't exactly something to be mucked with either. Yeah, they're, from what I've been told by the elders, they're, they're not all living creature either. They're half living creature, half something else. But different to, different to the Junjadi. Yeah, the Junjadi's. He's a shape shifting. 
He can speak anybody's voice he hears. Very tricky little man. Very tricky little man. Very clever. Ever since I was young, and my dad was with a full-blood tribal woman who was born in the bush. He's, he's got two kids to her. And every time she used to tell me relentlessly never to leave the kids outside playing at night time, make sure the house is locked, keep them inside. She's seen a lot of them, but, and I've heard stories from the elders, like elders that have now passed on, that lived not on missions, but proper communities 70, 80 years ago. They used to live with the Aborigines before the white man came here. They were like protectors of the tribe, the Junjati, but, oh, yeah, I know some stories, and I know them to be true. Back at that time at the Whopper Dam and this, yep. the big fellas sort of squatting behind the tree and, and peeking out and looking at you and, y- and your son, what did the face look like? What did the eyes look like? He didn't have the cone head. He had a rounded head and he was more human features, almost half human, half ape. The whole bush went, I knew, I knew but about 30 seconds before that branch cracked, that lo- it wasn't a branch, it was a log cracked because it echoed through the bush. I heard it plain as day over the radio and dude, I think he was just coming up to see what we were doing. Could you make out the colour of the eyes or was it too dark? They were big eyes, three, four times the size of ours. The eyeball itself and it was almost somewhat human. It was like looking into a giant man's eyes when you take away all the hairy and that bald skin, that bald grey skin. Hairy all over the face or was it? No, no. Up until just under the eyes. Yeah, he was hairy. Couldn't see whether it was fine hair, but you could see mostly just skin all on his chest and down his guts, down the flanks, but the rest of him, the hair on his forearms and down towards his shins and the back of his calves was long, probably five, six inches long. What colour was it? Dark brown, cool. really dark brown, like a like a deep walnut brown stain, almost black, but you could see the dark brown. He was dark, dark brown, almost black. Grey skin. Yeah, his skin was a real dark grey colour. Not a light grey, a real dark grey, like when you get a real dark stormy cloudy day. But the whole bush went quiet about 30 seconds before he stood on that log and cracked it. The whole bush went quiet. There was not a sound. Not a sound. Nothing. It's like the whole bush when he's here, I'll shut up now and just be quiet so he doesn't find me. We, we do hear that a lot from people who've had experiences and sightings with these fellas. Do you reckon it was male or female? Male. Oh, what gave you that feeling? You could see his build. He was huge. He was solid. You could see the expressions on its yep. face. Was that, was that because it's eyes and eyebrows and mouth? Facial expressions move and react very similar to ours. The walk butter is not normal, not normal the walk is because I watched him walk off. After he peeked at us, my brother screamed, I told him to shut up. Because he looked almost like a happy little baby when he's watching you do something or he's fascinated by something that you're doing. It was was like a real curious little stare, almost a half. It was like he had an impish grin on his face. Cheeky, serious. But when my brother started screaming, his whole facial expression went blank like he looked at my brother as to say, what the fuck is your problem? <laughs> What's your problem? No one else is carrying on like this. What is your go? And then I looked, just glanced at my brother and roared at him loud to shut up because I noticed the way he looked at him. At that split second, I thought he was just going to stand up, run out from behind the tree and grab my brother and crush him. How old do you reckon that the hairy fella that you saw, how, how old do you reckon he was? Young man, middle-aged man. In our terms, if they live as long as we do, I don't know anything about how long they live, but I just I know a lot about them from the elders and what they spoke about. There's actually a report of one that crossed the highway, not far from where I was at the Yamundi turnoff, actually. He ran across the highway and smacked into the side of a guy's van. The police dispatch lady's phone went rank and she laughed at a bloke and said, yeah, I know, because I just had two off-duty coppers seen it too, and he was about 10 feet tall, big, dark, black one. That's not something you want to be chased by. He was crossing from the coast side, so your Monday side of the highway back straight, he would have been heading practically straight up the back of where we were camped that night. So there's more than one there. So many reports that we've received over the years and still getting them around that area. Well, I found the video of the Pennsylvania white Bigfoot. I showed it to my father and his face went white as a sheet and he said, that's him, that's him, that's the one I seen. And I said, it can't be because that's in Pennsylvania, Dad. And Dad saw he's out the back of Yuba. 
38 kilometres out of Yilbar on the riverbank because that nan and pop lived in a marquee tent with a dirt floor, had 13 kids. They, dad, dad never saw a town until he was seven. And when he saw Dolby, he thought it was the whole rest of the world. Now, they'd grown up in the bush, my dad, as a kid, so he'd seen, he's seen a lot more than what he's told me. I know he has. He's a spiritual man, very spiritual man, yeah. a clever man, as a matter of fact, and, uh, and, and an astral traveller. I was actually speaking to a fella from New South Wales who mentioned Mount Pillar where people would go in the past to become clever men. He mentioned the same thing, it was astral travelling and shape-shifting. From the stories I've heard and what I've made sense of it, and all over the world, it's all the same now. You could dismiss it as non thumb if it was just one or two ancient races or primitive races talking about it. It is in every culture on every continent, they are everywhere, everywhere. But I think personally, and a lot of elders I spoke to and people that have seen them believe that they can slip between our dimension and the fourth dimension. So they're half spiritual being, half living. Because there's a story, I don't know if you've read it, it's an old one about a pioneer explorer in Australia and they had a run in with one. They were surveying land and this guy was a very credited pioneer and explorer in the early days of Australia and he had a, a couple of guys with him and they camped on a mount so it was in the central highlands of New South Wales somewhere their camp had been getting ransacked while they were out during the day so they decided after a few days to leave one fella back there well nothing happened that day it's like he knew that there was somebody there so he didn't come near the camp but that night he came back on all three of them and there was a tribe of full bloods camping down the river camped down in the gully and they came up and ensued a three or four hour fight and they killed they killed it and took it away. But only the elders were fighting it. They told him and everyone else that he was telling Porky Pies and he lost all credibility. He ended up pretty much a nobody. But to the day he died, he struck by the story that that's what he's seen. They heard the commotion, the tribe, and they came up and a massive fight ensued. Lots of men were killed. I've had them throw rocks at me, all sorts of things, but there is something that I've noticed, a pattern of that's going on in the United States of America and here, is marbles. Now, we're told as Aboriginal children the day we can understand talk, and you're not allowed to play marbles at night time. No, no, because that's what brings them. They like games. One of the other guys on, on the AYR team who works with us, Gary, he mentioned somebody spoke about leaving them gifts and Gary mentioned leaving them yep. marbles as a really marbles. I hadn't heard that yep. before, so it's really interesting that you've just mentioned the same thing. Well, it blew me out because my skin and hair literally stood up. I showed my wife, I said, look at the hair standing up on my neck. The hair on my face was standing up like the hair on a dog's back because I watched a video of a guy who'd been seeing one in America. It leaves three marbles on the back bumper of his car. And they never travel alone either. That's one thing that people need to understand. And they're just like us. Some are beautiful, loving, caring creatures, very curious, very friendly, very playful, but some are not, especially them pointy-headed guys. They're not to be mucked with. You see one of them, you better get out of there fast. I'll kill your dogs. I've had dogs killed in the bush. You mentioned in that chat you had with Paul that you lost four of your, your pig-hunting dogs, but one of them you found... In a tree about 14, about 14 feet high. Not a mark on it, though. But neck stretched. It broke the neck for sure, oh. 100%. They don't like dogs. They kill them real fast, real quick. Some dogs cower. I've seen dogs in the bush cower on them, and good, brave, hard dogs, tough dogs that will lock onto a scrub bull if you tell them to. They'll grab whatever you tell them to grab, and I've seen them cower and urinate and defecate and lay under the truck shivering until the sun comes up try and grab them and they try and attack you. Yeah. It's not your dog anymore for that time. It's not your dog. That's why I always keep a dog when I'm in the bush because it gives you some indication of something's not right. I didn't have a dog with me that night either. What do they most resemble to you? More man-like, more ape-like, or something completely different? The one I saw was more man-like because he had the round eyes, the normal round-shaped top of his head, Visible ears, the muscle on his neck, but went from like, it looked like it went from like where his actual ear hole is straight down to the top of his shoulder. Like it was, it was thick. It was, he was, he was a solid. Have you ever seen the Billy Apes? 
how big and solidly built they are and the neck muscles, what do they call them ones up there? The traps. Oh, the traps. Oh, yeah, yeah, the tra- They're just almost like a pyramid from the ears down behind your earlobe, nearly just straight down to the shoulder on that straight, and you can see it's there. It's massive. The tree knocking is one thing that I hear a lot when I'm out camping in the bush, mm. and that's, that is them talking to each other. That's how they communicate. That much it would take a year to tell you just what I know just from the elders themselves and not just what I've seen and been through. And what I've noticed too is they're attached to certain bloodlines, certain families. And it doesn't matter what race you are, you could be any race, but usually if, you, if your grandparent or your parent has seen one, you will see one. That's how it is. You will see one in your life. It's like they're attracted to certain people or are, and the feeling they give too. When they look at you, it's like they know everything you've ever done, said and thought. Everything. Everything. Make you sick. Nauseous to your stomach. You can feel it. As I said, if it was one or two indigenous ancient cultures that said, oh, yeah, these things have been in our culture, but it's every culture in the world. I don't know whether I mentioned to Paul, but I met a Cambodian man, and this man was unlike any other man I've ever met in my life, and he told me a story. He was the master hunter of his tribe. This guy was a Cambodian black tiger for 15 years and a refugee camp leader for 10. He spoke seven different languages, had the whole Buddhist Bible tattooed over his entire body. Powerful spiritual man like Cambodian black tigers is bad force, military force, very, very vicious people. His responsibility for his village was he was the sole hunter for his whole village, and he told me a story one night. I'd known the man for quite a while, and he told me a story that when they used to go into the bush to hunt over there, that there was these little bush children, and they'd have to leave food for these children as a show of respect to hunt, hunt that part of the bush. And... He said, we put food there. When we came back out, the food would always be gone. And I asked, what do they look like? Can you explain to me? And he said, like a little child. And I said, okay, okay. But does he have another form? Is that really what he looks like? Or does he have another form? And he looked at me with the most funniest look on his face, stared deep into my soul and said, yeah, yeah, Bill, they do. And I said, what is it, Con? What do they look like? And what he described to me was Junjati, Junjati. Same. And he shapeshifts into little children. He mucks with the children. He takes children away. That's what he does. That's his job. Oh, that's scary. Janjari is not something you want to muck with. Not something you want to play with. That is that is something different all again. All again. My dad's seen him with two other guys in Riverview Boys Home and a screw. Captain Andrews, I forget his first name, but he's seen it. He shot at it with a 12-gauge shotgun. And my dad said it was at Westbrook Boys Home, him, another little white fellow and another Aboriginal fellow seen it. And he screamed. It was underneath the stairs because they used to sneak down the stairs of the hall and duck around the corner to smoke tea leaves and pencil shavings because they didn't have cigarettes in Boys Home back then. Mm-hmm. And um, when Dad went to walk back up the stairs, he was standing under the stairs. with his, He had long arms too that nearly touched the ground. He looked like Cousin It. That's what Dad said. But he had big, round, oh, the size of a tennis ball, eyes and they were like jade green mirrors you could see your reflection in it but it was like looking at a shiny polished jade stone and it never blinked a tiny small mouth really little mouth but when dad screamed at him he screamed back exactly the same way that my father screamed exactly the same he mocked he mocked his scream identical he said it was like i screamed and then i screamed twice but it was him that screamed back at my father. And he snapped his head up and looked up towards the landing above him because he heard Captain Andrews coming out of the top of the hall. And Dad said he would have run because it was about 250 metres from where that building was to the edge fence on the river at Riverview Boys Home. He covered that distance in about five seconds flat. Dad said he ran low to the ground and the hair was blowing. You could see the hair was about a foot and a half long. It was hanging off him and it was like... He was moving that fast, it was blowing straight back. Like if you were flying down the highway on a motorbike with your hair out, and just going, that's, that's how fast he moved. And Captain Andrews, he pulled my father up when I was 23 years old in the main street of Toowoomba, tapped him on the shoulder and said, how you going, Dawson? And Dad turned around, he didn't know who he was. He said, hey, how you going, mate? He said, sorry, but um, who are you? And he said, it's Captain Andrews from Riverview Boys Home. And Dad literally got on his knees because he had a lot of respect for the man. He was the only one that never punished and tortured my father when he was in boys' home. He was a good man, a good man. 
he right in front of me said, oh, Dad, so this is my son, Bill, you know, and he, wow, you know, he looked like your dad. And he turned to my dad and he said, I hit him, David. I hit him twice in the back with that 12 pad shotgun. I hit him twice and he kept running. He kept running. He's seen it too. In broad daylight, I asked an Aboriginal woman, I was staying with her daughter and her husband at the time, I was offside with him, he was a truck driver and they lived in Ballina. And her mother was a very old woman with diabetes and she sat up one night. I wanted to talk to her about it, but I just couldn't build the courage up because she was a very old woman. She was in her 80s at that time, 81, 82. I met her in her mid-70s. She used to go to bed same time every night after her insulin medication. She stayed up really late one night. Julie asked her mum, you know, you should be in bed, mum, what are you doing up late? And she looked straight at me with a big smile and said, I believe the young man wants to ask me some questions. And Julie said, Billy, what do you want? What do you want to ask? And I said, I don't want to ask her nothing. And she looked at me and said, don't lie. She knew I'd wanted to ask. And she was a spiritual woman. I felt her presence around me even before she was in the room. I knew she was around me. I could feel her. Same as my father. I can feel him when he's close to me. Like a... I did hear something recently from an Aboriginal fellow who mentioned that the bad ones smell like sulphur. Like a, a sulfuric smell, rotten. a rotten, rotten, but the good ones also smell, but they don't smell rotten and bad like the bad ones do. That's right. I didn't get a smell of him that night. Yeah, I didn't smell him that night, but Dad said he smelled a foul odour, and the one he seen was a cone head one, and he didn't have round eyes, they were a triangular shaped eye. That's what Dad said. The one he saw was a dirty off white colour, and he would have been about seven and a half, eight feet tall, but he was. I said, were you scared? And Dad said, no, I wasn't. It was like he just came over to, because they were setting up old tins and that, because they lived in a marquee tent with a dirt floor and a pot belly stove, and they used to go out in the bush and practice throwing rocks at things. Yeah. And it was him and him and two and his brothers that seen it there. He heard the footsteps in the dry creek bed on the gravel, and when he looked, he was standing right there to the side, about 10 feet away in broad daylight. And Dad said he was a dirty off-white colour. The government knows they're out there. Our government and the American government know that they're out there. Could you imagine if they come clean and said, oh, there could be 500, 600, a million massive hairy men between 7 feet and 12 feet tall living out in the bush? Pandemonium. There'd be pandemonium. Oh, we'd lock up our houses. We wouldn't even <laughs> we wouldn't even go outside anymore at yeah. night time. People, it would be just mass hysteria. Yeah, and you'd have lots of idiots running around with guns out in the bush. But I honestly you know? don't think they care about us. I hope one day that people like you guys can finally put it to rest and bring it out into the open properly so everybody understands what we're mucking with here, what, what we're not what we're mucking with, but what we are living under because they have been here long before we are here and I believe they'll be here long after we are gone. Yeah. And that's the understanding that people have got to come to. We don't want to – what I'm scared of is somebody gets one and kills it and does – bad things chopping, I don't want that to happen. They're a deep part of my dad's ancestors' culture and every Aboriginal person's culture, and I believe actually every culture's culture, black, white, blue, green or purple on this planet. But we've lost touch with them. There could have been a time a thousand, two, three, five, ten thousand years ago that we spoke to these creatures, that they were part of our society. We don't know that. We never will. Because the stories have become too diluted and tribes have been smashed and obliterated into annihilation. Their language, their dream time, their stories have been diluted, watered down, and some of them don't even exist anymore. And this is the problem. We need to pull back because, as I say, every human being, no matter what colour they were a thousand years ago, had to keep their hands up to feed themselves. They had to hunt for their own food. They had to work the land and make the land work with them and for them not against them, and at the moment we deserve not to be here. You all know that. You're obviously a bush person and you respect Mother Earth. Yeah. We are a cancer. We don't deserve to be here, and I believe that's what they believe too. And that's the last thing any of us at AYR, we don't, want, we don't want to kill one. We don't want to hunt them. We don't that, want them to harm them at all. The, my honest opinion is the way we are. We want to know, but we don't want to intrude or... We just want to see where we're curious. Human beings are curious creatures. That's why we have evolved as fast as we have in the last 500 years. But before that, we were like primitive cavemen. It took us a thousand years to come out of the dark ages. I, I look at it now and I've said, I said, we're at an evolutionary stall at the moment. It's like we've stalled and there's nowhere else to go. Maybe we should start reverting back to where we come from. 
it's in every human being. I'm starting to notice more and more white people that are getting in touch with this this ancient bloodline of their people and going out into the bush and working the land and living off the land and that is what we need to go back to. The direction we are heading is not good and we've been warned by all things, all spirits. We've been warned many, many times through history and we're getting warned now. Look how big and strong they grow out in the bush. Look how puny and weak we are. That scares me. The people that got them hairs off Bobo and other people have said that if that hair is off an actual creature, it'd have to be. It'd have to be over five million years old. All of these things that are in the bush, there's a reason why, and I know it. There's a reason why, since the beginning of any sort of spoken history on this planet, people have been told to stay away from the deepest, darkest parts of the bush, because there are things out there that live that or exist, not live but exist, that we don't want nothing to do with, and we will never understand. Never, never, ever, ever.